Good afternoon. If everyone can take their seats, um, we can start. We have a star, rock star um, panel, so um, I certainly don't want to cut their time short. And I know you've been to um, many fantastic panels, discussions and forums throughout the day, and you will hear more in the, uh, later on in the afternoon. Um, but I just want you to know that you chose the right panel to be in. This is probably going to be the best rock star, star panel you'll hear uh, for the day. So we will, we, we will use your time very wisely. My name is Trin Nguyen, and I have the privilege of moderating um, the panel t today on economic opportunity across the city. I'm the director of the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development. And I'm just going to say a little bit about the economic opportunity in Boston, why a topic like this is so important, and introduce you to the panelists. In Boston, we grew the numbers of jobs in the city of, to record levels. Boston added more than 60,000 jobs from 2014 to 2016. More people are working in our city than ever. The city's unemployment rate dropped from an average of 6.1% in 2013 to 3.4% in 2016. There was a quarter in December of last year was 2.7%. So you can imagine how tight the labor market in the city is. The um, GDP has increased to, by close to 4% each of the last several years outpacing the national average. However, with this growth and prosperity, unfortunately, the divide in the city between those who have and have not is widening. For example, in both Suffolk and Middlesex counties, the unemployment rate for black workers exceed that of white. Non-Hispanic workers by ratios greater than two to one, Hispanic Latino workers also experience higher rates of unemployment compared to white workers. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Racial minorities and foreign-born workers are economically disadvantaged. The median an annual income of whites in Boston, for example, is 51,000 compared to the median for blacks, that's 29,000 Hispanics, 21,300, and Asians, 36,000 residents. Among full-time workers, the native-born average is 57,000 in annual sal salary, while the foreign-born average is only 41,000. In terms of liquid assets, not including cash, the color of wealth revealed that for every dollar of savings that white households had, US, had in the U.S., black households only had an average of two cents. Caribbean black household only had an average of 14 cents, and Puerto Ricans and Dominican households had an average of less than 1%, according to the Boston Federal Reserve report. And lastly, on the asset count data profile of Boston completed by the Corporation for Enterprise Development, or CFED, in 2014, it detailed that while 17% of Boston's households live in poverty, nearly half, which is 46.3%, are liquid asset poor, which means that they lack sufficient income to level at poverty level for three months if faced with a job loss, medical crisis, or other income disruptions. We cannot be a city that leaves others behind. An inclusive and economically equitable city is one that truly provides equal access to economic opportunity for every resident. This is why it's important for the city to focus on this topic across disciplines, from inclusive economic growth in industrial job corridors to accessibility to jobs and the quality of jobs, closing the, the gender wage gap, and to measuring how we're doing across these sectors. And we have an excellent panel of experts to engage us with both policy and practice. Our star panel includes Peter Firth from Northeastern University towards the end, Austin Nyhaus from the Initiative for a Competitive Inner City, Megan Costello, the Executive Director of the Boston Women's Workforce Council, and Tom Jeff from Mass economics. We welcome our panelists. Let's give them a clap, folks. Peter, would you like to uh, present? Yes. Okay. I think you All right. Okay. All right. Well, 
Hello, I, I'm going to have to leave uh, as, soon as, as soon as I speak uh, because I, I am speaking at another conference, which is also today, at UMass Boston. Um, but uh, I have my bike, so you see, I have accessibility, though it's not, it's not low stress yet. Um, so bicycling is, is, good, is good for your personal health, and bicycling is good for our society. Uh, it, it, there's, there, there's a choice that, as a society, to, to make. Should we look at bicycling as, that's just a niche thing. Okay, there's some people, that's their thing. All right, so let them do their thing. Maybe even make a few provisions for them to do their thing. Or should it be, we really want to promote bicycling as a mass mode of transportation. And there are compelling arguments that in our dense cities, like Boston, Mass cycling should be a societal goal. And the reasons are just so obvious, I'm not going to go into them. Public health, you know, we need exercise. Bicycling makes it possible to get your exercise as part of your daily life. Climate change, sustainability, economic opportunity, because bicycles are inexpensive. Uh, almost everybody can, can afford one. And then livability uh, and competitiveness, a competitive city to attract Talented people, talented people, they like walkability, they like bikeability. And not only is would it, it it's, you, you can dream, oh, this would be good, but we hear a lot, yeah, but we don't do that. You know, that's just, you know, Dutch people bicycle, but that's, they're different, they're made out of cheese, you know, or, yeah, the people in Portland bicycle, yeah, but, but, but. But it's, 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 it's been proven in, in city after city, and, uh, in, in, uh, in Boston, it would work too. And, there's, and when we survey people and ask, why don't you ride a bike? What would it take for you to ride more? They give a lot of different reasons. You know, I have to haul my kids here and there. I need my, I need my car for work. There are, there are a, lot of, a lot of reasons. But the most common reason is traffic danger. And I'm a civil engineer, transportation engineer, and it's actually really fortunate that that's the main problem because you know, I can't control your kids, and I can't control what your job requirements are, but we own the streets. That's something we can control. We can protect cyclists from danger. So uh, I invented a, a method of classifying streets by level of traffic stress. Uh, others had done something like that, but they, they were just too data intensive and so on. So we, we can think of the, the, the traffic stress that a person experiences riding on a bike and high to low. So level four uh, is uh, really high stress. And these levels of stress are tied to different segments of the population. And, and there is a segment of the population who doesn't mind riding in conditions like that. And that segment is called the strong and fearless. And they're a very small segment of the population. And then, uh, then there's tra level of traffic stress three. OK, so this, this is a. a uh, Brookline, that I could almost throw a, throw a stone that, uh, to, at, at St. Mary's from where we're standing. But because this bike lane is blocked all the time by double parked cars and whatnot, you've got to go out into traffic and so on. And that's still pretty stressful. Uh, there is that maybe 10% of the population would put up with conditions like that. But if we look at countries like the Netherlands and Denmark, where there really is mass cycling. In fact, any place where there's mass cycling, it's because people are protected from traffic stress. So this is level of traffic stress two. There, there is space for you to ride, and it's, it's, um, it, it's non-contested space. It's space for bikes that cars just won't go into because they don't have any reason to go in there. And then level of traffic stress one, uh, uh, where, where you're really separated, you're either totally separated from, physically separated from traffic like here, or you're on a nice quiet street uh, and uh, everybody's happy to, to ride in a place like that. So um, there are some criteria for uh, the level of traffic stress and without going into the, 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 the details of it, uh, the main three factors are how many lanes is a street? Is it an unlaned street the way most of our local streets, local streets are? If it's a multi-lane street, you're almost doomed to high stress if you are in mixed traffic. Now, if you've got 
separate places for bicycling. That's how you get it. And then it depends on, uh, a little bit depends on the traffic level and, and, and the speed. And you can see, you know, the higher the speed, the more the traffic, the more lanes, the higher the stress is. So there are similar tables like that for bike lanes because some bike lanes are high stress, some are low stress. So we classified all the streets in Boston uh, for a couple points in time. This is Boston's bike infrastructure in 2016. Almost, there's, there's a few uh, paths that we know, a few shoulders, no bike lanes at the time. 2015, you can see there's a lot added. A lot of bike lanes are added. Yet, if you live here, you know that, but wait a second, you really, there, there really hardly is a way to get from here to there safely on a bike. You still have to fight traffic. And you can see that all these little pieces, all these little pieces, a little piece of bike lane, it's almost like toothpicks dropped onto a coffee table. They don't connect to form a coherent network. So we classified everything like this, and uh, high stress is tan and low stress is green. If I subtract away all the high stress streets, this is what you're left with. And you still see a lot of green, a lot of, lot of low-stress places. But you can also see, who there's a gap here. You just, you just can't get through. And indeed, there is a barrier. There is not a single low-stress connection across that barrier. So what that means is if you're in South Boston, you just can't get to anywhere else in Boston uh, unless you're willing to ride in heavy traffic, which most people aren't. And likewise, to get to South Boston or UMass. There's also uh, a line here. If you're from the south side of Boston, nope, you can't get to any opportunities on the north side, not unless you're willing to ride in heavy traffic at least part of your ride. In fact, there are so many barriers. These are the same barriers, A, A, B, B, and I just drew in all the others. It's just barrier, barrier, barrier that you just can't get through. And uh, especially serious are barriers in our high employment areas. So here's where all the jobs are in the Boston area, and then we just asked, can you get from here to there? So in, in uh, 2006, uh, red means uh, you, can, you have low stress bike access to less than 1% of the jobs, and you see it's almost all red. We go to 2014, 2015, and still the dominant color is red. For the most part, no, you can't get from here to there unless you're willing to ride in heavy traffic. And that's because of the bike network as I described. Now, the Boston Cyclist Union is pushing for a, a different vision, a, a vision called Bikeways for Everybody, in which we have protected bike paths uh, going to every neighborhood and, and, and safe routes through the downtown as well. And if we did that network, that's what you end up with. Green, this dark green is 70% or more. There's a few pockets that, that aren't connected with some small fixes to the network, we could get them green too. This is, a, this is a world of difference. 70%, 70, for 77% of people, I, and they aren't, they aren't all going to ride a bike, but if I told you, you have, among your options to travel, a safe, protected bike route, a lot of people would choose that, and that would be such a game changer. Uh, we could also look at accessibility to high schools. We could look at accessibility to anything. But, for instance, the John D. O'Brien High School. Currently, from which neighborhoods can you have low-stress bike access to John D. O'Brien? It's a total black hole. None. None. It's just not possible. You, you are allowed to, but you're going to be riding in high stress. With, uh, with, uh, uh, with a, the bikeway network that we could build, you could get from almost every neighborhood to that high school, and we could do other high schools the same way. So we looked at a couple improvement scenarios, and uh, two that are interesting uh, here's the, the Columbia Road improvement, is to put a, uh, protected bike lanes on Columbia Road and the southern part of Mass Ave. That's something that's really needed. And another is break down the barriers in downtown. Uh, and it's interesting how, how they change. So here's the current. If you only add Columbia Road, yeah, you get some improvement in the Columbia Road corridor, but not that much because there aren't that many jobs in that corridor. You still have face a barrier when you try to get into the LMA or to downtown. If you fix downtown, so much of an improvement all over the place, including quite a bit of improvement in the Columbia Road area. And if you do both, that's where you get your big improvement. So a network analysis like this will, will, will show how, uh, help you prioritize and, and target improvements 
uh, we, uh, it's especially important to have improvements right around our, uh, our busy destinations where people can get to and then uh, to make uh, access to everybody. Uh, what are policy changes that we need at the city level to achieve a low stress bike network? Uh, I'm, I'm short on time, but the, the most important thing is a vision. If you don't believe people are going to ride a bike, well, then don't waste any money on it. And that's the attitude of a lot of people. That you know, it, We just don't do that. They can't see that uh, there's a new generation, that, uh, that, that if, if that opportunity were there, people really would ride. Uh, we need to prioritize road space, get our engineers on board, and we need uh, a budget. Bicycling is cheap, but it's not dirt cheap. Uh, what we're spending today, $400 per person roughly on transit, $600 per person on autos per year, uh, and $1.50 on bikes. Getting the, getting the amount we spend on bikes up to the you know, $10, $20 level, <laughs> it wouldn't hurt these others very much. It's, you could do it with the pocket change uh, if we had a vision for it. So uh, that, yeah, there you go. We have. Still not working. Oh, okay. That is fine. Great. Oh, no worries. Uh, <laughs> now that that's squared away. Uh, thanks so much for, for coming to this on a, on a uh, rainy afternoon. I'm glad you guys are all sticking around. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the work, uh, recent work we've been doing around uh, creating economic opportunities, um, specifically in industrial areas in the greater Boston area, um, both in Boston um, up to and up in the north in Malden. New slide? <laughs> no. Or maybe we won't talk about this. We can talk about bike lanes more. That was really. Yeah, we can all like huddle around. <laughs>
Uh, no. That's the one. Yeah, that's fine. Um, who's going to make the Mac versus PC joke uh, right now? <laughs> great, great. Uh, so let's zoom through this. <laughs> um, so yeah, so today I'm going to talk about the work we've been doing um, over the last uh, couple of years or so. Um, that's really focused on creating economic opportunity um, in industrial areas uh, across the region. Um, and just quickly, just to start, um, so I'm at the Initiative for Competitive Inner City. I'm a senior researcher there. Um, and we're a nonprofit economic research organization. We're based in uh, Roxbury and Dudley Square. Um, but we do work across the country that's focused on um, inner city economic development issues. Um, and just to start by framing our research uh, on industrial corridors in the context of this talk, uh, in the context of this panel. Um, so when we think about economic opportunity, we really think about inclusive economic, economic opportunity, and that means for all residents. Um, and in particular, at ICIC, we, we're focused on inner city residents. Um, so inner cities for us, we define as areas of, of high concentrated poverty and unemployment. Um, and the research that we've been doing over the last uh, about two years or so um, has really identified that industry clusters or, or compositions of, of industries in a given location um, can really be used as a tool to Id identify these uh, inclusive economic opportunities. So there's um, this work that my colleague uh, Kim Zulian and, and uh, our, one of our researchers, researchers at MIT had, had done uh, about two years ago at this point. Um, had found that uh, inner, or clusters that are strong, um, both in the inner city um, and then the rest of the city and the rest of the region, are more likely to grow faster um, um, in inner cities um, versus uh, clusters that are, are not strong in one of those areas or aren't competitive advantages in those areas. Um, and then further, we take that sort of information and couple it with um, workforce uh, data and ed educational data to identify of those clusters that are strong in the inner city, um, what actually matches with the skill set of inner city residents? Because the, the whole goal is to create economic opportunity for all. Um, so, so that's sort of the basic premise of, of how we think about this work. Oh, mystery slide. Uh, so the work we've been doing in industrial areas are really centered around two areas, really three areas. Um, we've done work um, along the Fairmount line in, in Boston. Um, and along Commercial Street in Malden. Um, and, and really the goal for us for thinking about, um, thinking about economic development strategies in these areas um, is that historically they've been uh, job centers and accessible job centers um, that provide both living wage jobs but also um, um, accessible jobs with lower educational levels. Um, so jobs in these areas tend to be manufacturing, construction, distribution, um, jobs like that. Um, that generally don't require a, a bachelor's degree or, or more um, to, to uh, enter into those industries. Um, so the cities that we've worked with um, in these areas of Boston and, and Malden, um, their focus on growing these areas is really centered around uh, business and talent attraction or retention in these areas. Um, uh, and so for us, what we do is look at look at these areas through a cluster perspective to sort of identify what are the key economic strengths in the area um, and, and sort of frame these strategies um, with that inclusivity lens. So just quickly um, going through the three areas that we looked at, um, first starting with, with our, our work along the Fairmont Corridor, which is um, the area um, sort of circling um, uh, around the Fairmount line, which connects South Station um, to uh, uh, Reedville and Hyde Park. Um, and so we looked at two industrial areas. So New Market, which is, runs along Mass Ave, um, and that's been sort of, a, for the last 50 or so years, has been um, a major food, uh, food distribution center for the city. Um, and then also Reedville, which is at the southern end of, of the Fairmount line, which is both residential and mixed-use uh, um, industrial land area. 
Um, and then for our work in Malden, so we looked at the Commercial Street Corridor, um, which is really um, the area between Malden Center and Wellington Station on the Orange Line. Um, and this has been a historical manufacturing center um, for Malden for, for, for over a century, really. Um, and, and the corridor um, still today is a, a major manufacturing center. Um, it it uh, contains 57% uh, of, of the industrial zone land in Malden. Um, so, so just talking about our, our cluster analysis and, and sort of what we did. So what we did um, is look at um, what's strong in these industrial areas. So what's strong in Newmarket, what's strong in Reedville, what's strong in Malden, um, and what, also what's strong in the rest of the region. Um, and we, use this, we did this using census uh, zipping county business pattern data. Um, and so we looked at cluster strength using uh, location quotient, which is just a, a measure of how specialized a certain um, industry cluster is in a given geography. Um, and then we use cluster, uh, cluster definitions from the US Cluster Mapping Initiative, which is a, a group out of Harvard Business School that focuses on, on clusters across the, the US. Um, and then sort of uh, an additional piece that we did in Malden was looking at that, that sort of wage and educational component of these clusters to figure out how to best match um, the strong clusters in these areas to, to uh, the, the local workforce. So I'll breeze through these, but this is basically the results from, from our analysis for all three areas. So starting with the fair amount work um, in new markets. So we identified uh, seven competitive clusters out of um, a list of 67 clusters from, from the US cluster mapping um, uh, initiative. Um, and how we came to these seven clusters were basically how strong is it in um, the industrial area, how strong is it in the rest of the region and Boston, uh, and also has it grown through time. So we looked at a five-year period growth rate um, and also a, a sort of minimum level of employment to, uh, to knock out sort of the small small clusters in each of these areas. Um, and in new market, really what we see is that most of the competitive assets have been there historically. So food, uh, fishing and fish products, which is fish processing um, and wholesale and livestock processing, which is livestock processing and wholesale, um, have generally are the, the strong clusters um, in new market, but there are also a number of additional new industries um, in the area too. So like marketing and design, um, and publishing, which is in new market publishing industry, so print publishers, um, is strong both in new market but also in the rest of Boston and the rest of the region. Um, and this is one of those clusters that we've highlighted in that earlier research, is that if it's strong in one area, in new market and the rest of the area, um, it's more likely to grow faster um, in new market. And, and uh, uh, we do indeed see that it grew 111% um, over a five year period. Um, and then, so Reedville, we did the same analysis. Um, Reedville um, sort of has that uh, a similar manufacturing uh, background. So food processing and man manufacturing is a strong cluster in Reedville, but there's also distribution, warehousing, wholesale, storage. Um, those are sort of the strong industries or strong clusters um, in Reedville. Um, and then just sort of connecting this all back to how do we grow these, these areas? Um, how do we um, develop them economically? Um, so as part of this work, we did this analysis, but also talked to business owners um, in both areas to sort of identify what are the key strengths and the key barriers for growing these industries um, in both areas. And it sort of varies um, between or by, by, uh, by uh, land area. So in new market, for example, zoning always came up as an issue as a, a barrier for attracting businesses. And also the, just the lack of general uh, amenities to, for attracting employers and businesses. So there aren't restaurants there. It makes it difficult for, for employees to want to come. And it also, um, there are sort of issues of sort of public perceptions of safety too. Um, and Reedville, sort of a completely different beast. Um, we found that in general, there's just sort of a lack of planning for businesses in the area, um, and also a lack of a, a sort of a political advocacy voice for the business community. Um, and lastly, I'll just end with the work we've done in Malden. Um, so similar work, um, we added some additional um, elements to our analysis. So we, also, we looked at what's strong in Malden, but we also looked at what's strong in the surrounding communities around it. Um, so we looked at what's strong in Chelsea, Everett, Medford, Revere, and Somerville. Um, so these are sort of 
um, linked areas to Malden as well. Um, and then we also looked at that uh, accessibility and living wage component. So we looked at how many of these jobs in each of these uh, strong clusters required less than a bachelor's degree. And those are those 50% uh, or less than a bachelor's degree. Those are the ones in orange. Um, and then those that provided higher average wages than, than the regional average. And those are the ones uh, in yellow in the last column. Um, and again, so, so Malden's is a bit different than, than or uh, Commercial Street Corridor is a bit different than the other two. Sort of has a mix of high-tech industries and sort of advanced manufacturing. So aerospace was a strong cluster um, in Malden. Medical devices has the potential to emerge. Um, but there's also sort of those legacy industries too, so like food processing and manufacturing, um, and also sort of those amenities that, that businesses um, and employees also look for too. And just to end, just sort of why do we care about this? Um, so, so our research really confirms that idea that industrial corridors are significant job centers, um, that they do deserve sort of investment. Um, and, and our data also confirms that, that they do offer living wage jobs too, um, and they're also accessible um, to a variety of skill sets. Um, and, and specifically around our cluster work, um, sort of this analysis, this type of analysis can help frame and identify um, what are strong clusters in the area and also that final piece about inclusivity, um, what, what matches the actual workforce skill set too. So I'll just end there. And hopefully the next one works. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Happy almost 3.30 afternoon on a Friday, uh, rainy. It's great to be with you all today. Uh, let's see if this works. Yes, it does. It's great. Um, so my name is Megan Costello. I'm the executive director of the Mayor's Office of Women's Advancement um, here in Boston. Um, this presentation was prepared by myself and my colleague, Annalise uh, barnes Classen, who is actually here at BU at the Harari Institute. Um, we have a really terrific partnership uh, that I'm going to talk a little bit about through the Boston Women's Workforce Council. Um, you know, my work is really centered around um, how women are critical to the economy. Um, women make up the majority of our city. Uh, women of color make up the majority of our city. Um, but women are underrepresented in every aspect of city life, um, whether that be culturally, politically, uh, economically. And so this office was created by Mayor Walsh in uh, June of, or excuse me, yeah, June of 2014 um, when we came into office to really think differently about how are we advancing and serving our women and girls in the city of Boston. Um, when you have the majority of your city that is women, that is women of color, but they are not paid equally or they are not participating equally in um, you know, city life, then that doesn't just hurt them as individuals, but it hurts everybody. Um, and so for Mayor Walsh, this is as much about social justice and the right thing to do as it is about the strength of our economy. So I'm gonna um, quickly go into a very broad brush of what we do. Every issue is a woman's issue, so I often do uh, argue my way to every single table. Um, but we are gonna talk specifically today about some of the work that we're doing on the wage gap. So this is a little overview of some of the projects that my office is working on. We are always interested in hearing from folks about their own experiences. Um, the gender wage gap is a big part of our work that we're gonna get into, reducing the demand for sex trafficking um, by expanding housing services, arresting buyers, we have a women entrepreneurs program where we're really trying to focus on growing uh, women's businesses, not just starting them. Childcare affordability, this is a huge reason why women leave the workforce. It's a huge reason why families are leaving Boston. Um, and what are we doing in our own backyard? You know, Mayor Walsh um, knows that our, the city of Boston is not perfect, right? Our own workforce, uh, we have things that we need to do. Uh, I think one thing I really appreciate about government is that um, we are not afraid to be critical of ourselves, and we know that we're not perfect as well. So uh, let's talk about the gender wage gap. The gender wage gap is very complex. It has existed since the beginning of time. Uh, I think back oftentimes to Abigail Adams uh, writing to her husband, John, just trying to be relevant and being part of the U.S. Constitution. I think about, you know, the women's right to vote in 1920 for white women. I think about the civil rights movement and what that meant for women of color. I think about um, President Kennedy, you know, signing uh, the Equal Pay Act in, in 1963. But we still have not closed the gender wage gap. What are we doing? Um, and so, you know, we know this is a complex problem. 
And we know that government has a role to play. But we also understand that government cannot solve all of our problems, that we need every single person, men and women, employers, individual women, and government to contribute. Because we aren't just trying to solve a legislative problem. We aren't just trying to put new laws into place because we know that when laws do exist, not everybody always follows them, right? We are trying to change culture. And so the question for Mayor Walsh and the question for us was really around how do you use public policy to influence that culture? How do you use the bully pulpit of the mayor's office um, to really lead by example and make changes in this space? And so we have decided, and this is not groundbreaking work, research has told us this, this is the approach that we should be taking to a variety of issues, but we'll, we'll talk about the wage gap today. Um, but it really is about everybody thinking about their own perspective and, and the way they can contribute here. So um, we're gonna talk about employers, individual women in government. Um, so briefly, legislation. Uh, when we came into office, um, you know, the same, Mayor Walsh came from the State House and the same bill had been filed year after year after year um, to provide, uh, to, to make equal pay uh, legal here in Massachusetts. It finally passed uh, two years ago and it goes into effect uh, this summer. So everybody should be aware of that law. Uh, it's really an important part of the equation here, but it doesn't solve all our problems. So employers will no longer be able to allow, uh, to ask you for your salary history, because that's irrelevant. Um, there'll be more transparency. Uh, and there'll also be an opportunity for employers who do discover a wage gap to have a six month period where they can close that gap. Because one of the biggest reasons why this legislation didn't pass is because the business community was so afraid to look at their numbers because they were afraid of lawsuits. And so we took away, um, you know, that reason, that excuse for not wanting to participate here. You can learn more about the legislation there and I would encourage everybody to um, be informed about it. The second thing um, that our office does is we need to train individual women. We, you know, we know that women are socialized differently than men and we know that women are great advocates for everybody except themselves. And so we said, okay, what can we do here to give some really concrete tools to women to negotiate their salaries? I remember when I graduated from college, my dad said to me, you're gonna go in there, you're gonna slam a number down on the table, and you're gonna demand what you want, and then you're gonna walk out of the room and you know, get the money you deserve. And I was like, what, are you kidding me? That's not gonna work, that's not authentic to who I am. As women, we wanna be collaborative, you know, we know that there's unconscious bias for when we're aggressive. So this is about creating safe spaces for women to understand some concrete tools um, one, knowing their value, right? Writing out what are your hard and soft skill sets. Women bring a lot of that soft skills to the workplace and how valuable is that to our organizations, right? Identifying your target salary and benefits package. How do you do the research when salaries are no longer, or not transparent right now? Um, how do you do this? What's the strategy? What's the timing of it? What's your pitch? You know, who are you talking to? Um, what's the lighting in the room? I mean, the energy, all of this stuff matters, right? What's your strategy? And then practicing taking away the anxiety around negotiations. So I like to say, yes, you're gonna practice your pitch, you're gonna write it out, you're gonna do the research, and you're gonna know how to ask for your salary, but let's practice negotiations in our everyday lives. Free breakfast at a hotel. This weekend I am staying at a hotel down the Cape and I have negotiated free breakfast for myself the next morning. Think about negotiating meeting times, right? Every single day there's an opportunity presented to you um, to practice negotiations. The case study uh, on the first year showed us that of the 7,000 women we have trained so far out of 85,000, 87% took immediate action. 48% um, negotiated uh, increased compensation or um, were promoted to another job. And this has a ripple effect. Women are talking about this for the first time and we're really no, no longer keeping this behind closed doors or keeping our anxieties to ourselves. Um, Next, Boston Women's Workforce Council. So this is the work with employers. Employers have a huge responsibility and a huge opportunity to close the gender wage gap. So quickly, we have a board of, uh, or an advisory body of 27 business leaders here in Boston that um, advise Mayor Walsh and the Boston business community on what we need to close the wage gap. It's a public-private partnership between the mayor's office, uh, the business community, and Boston University, who is our host. Um, we have our co-chairs, Kathy Minahan and Evelyn Murphy. There's an executive committee that is, I'm part of, and, as well as the co-chairs. And then there's the executive director of the council. Super complicated, right? Typical government. Um, and uh, then we have Annalise, who is also part of the team over here at uh, Boston University. So what is the work we're doing with employers? What are we asking them to do? 
We have 227 employers, some of the largest here, State Street, Mass Mutual, Vertex, Partners Healthcare, and some of the smaller ones too, uh, representing 227 businesses that are part of this compact. We ask them to look at their own data to see if a wage gap exists. We ask them to take very specific steps to close those gaps. We have an interventions report with uh, data-driven interventions. And then we ask them, this is very unique, and, and we're the only ones in the country doing this, to anonymously report their wage data um, using the technology that the Hurry Institute developed for us so that we can understand the aggregate data of what the gap here is in Boston. Every organization is going to have it different. The, the gap for some places might be a few cents. It might be significantly more than that. For some folks, it's about where are women in the organization. This is not a one-size-fits-all. And so government can't just come in and say, this is what you should be doing. Um, we, have, we meet on a quarterly basis with these folks to really dig in and talk behind closed doors uh, in a place that is a safe place for businesses to um, share what, what's actually happening in their companies and what's working and what's not. Um, and then we you know, collect that wage data that's based on um, re real wages versus what the wage gap is estimated right now is based on census data. So it's actually not um, super accurate. Um, Really quickly, this is the uh, lovely chart that Hariri has made for us as to how we collect this data. It never leaves the organization. It's a snapshot, it's, um, it's masked, and then it is encrypted, and we get the aggregate data at the end of it. Um, happy, I think there's some Hariri folks here who are much smarter than me on this stuff. Um, and then just a couple of, of quick findings from the 2017 report. So we hear the national average of, for white women is 79 cents. Using real wage data with 16% of the greater Boston workforce represented, so a significant sample, we've actually found that it's 76 cents for white women. Um, so this is why it's so important to work with real employer data and that the gap is 24 cents. Um, we have it broken down by race. We know that the wage gap is significantly worse for women of color. We are a city that is majority women of color, so we know that this is not just you know unjust, but it hurts our economy. Um, and then it really does vary also by job category. You actually see a gap at some of the, a larger gap at some of the higher levels compared to some of the lower, lower or, or entry level positions. Um, so it's really important and we hope to, uh, in the 2018 report, um, look at it broken down by industry once we get more of a diverse cross section of industries. So I think this is a great example of how government can use both its tools of legislation um, but also the bully pulpit of whatever office it's hold. And I, and I hope you, there's lots of ways to connect with us, um, and I hope you check us out. Thanks. All right. Hey, um, so uh, pleasure to be here. Um, Going to sort of talk through some of our preliminary findings around measuring access to opportunity. So first... What the heck is that? Um, we're looking at skills access, which is sort of around, are there job opportunities even available to me uh, based on my educational attainment, based on my job skills? And then sort of, OK, great. Maybe there are some jobs that are open to me. How do I actually get to those jobs? And at what time cost and dollar cost? And that's driven by worker and job locations, then the availability and cost of transportation you know, getting from point A to point B. Um, there are some other factors around networks and uh, you know, information and social networks. We're not going to talk about them today, but just sort of put them on your radar. That also matters. So for this work, we were looking at the five counties uh, in the Massachusetts, um, sorry, the five count Massachusetts counties in the Boston MSA. So Essex, Middlesex, Norfolk, Plymouth, and uh, Suffolk. We just included some cities there. Get your bearings, because uh, Massachusetts does not love counties too much. They don't really care. Um, now, sort of the important context here is that the Boston area is actually, and we've heard some counter arguments to this, but compared to many other regions and cities in the US, Boston's actually pretty good on transit. Um, you know, you got the commuter rail, you have subways, you have pretty good bus network, you have, bike ne you have some bike lanes, you have a bike sharing system. Um, and right, uh, in a recent study, Boston was actually ranked sixth nationwide for transit accessibility. Um, but then the important but here is that that's great and all, but for lower income uh, residents and the unemployed, the actual costs of that travel in time and dollars really matters a lot for uh, both just 
getting, getting a job, and then sort of career development ladders. Um, so a little bit more background, just sort of commute times. I'm sure you can see the traffic. <laughs> um, commute times in Boston, uh, in the study area, they're actually lower than the US and many other regions just for public transit ridership. But cars, uh, vehicular traffic, it's pretty bad. Um, and the other important key point here is that it's gotten a lot worse since the recession, uh, sort of post-2010. It's bumped up quite a lot. Um, and the bottom right, you're seeing those sort of super commutes of over an hour really ramped up uh, in recent years. Um, what this map shows on the right is sort of, we're looking at the mean center, the average place of, uh, of uh, the jobs on the left in green, and then sort of the average location of the workforce uh, on the right. You see how that's moved over time. But the most interesting thing is, prior to the recession, they're about 4,700 feet apart. So, you know, here to there. Um, and then, in 2010, you have this massive bump, and that's driven, you know, labor people leaving the labor force, people uh, taking jobs, desperate for any job they can get. If it takes two hours to get there, they're gonna do it. But you can basically see that post-2010, it bumped up quite a lot to now it's about a mile um, overall in the distance between those two. So sort of system level, this is the big average, so hey, there's some noise in there, but still dramatic increase. Um, now looking at sort of how that varies by income, uh, since the recession, what's sort of a couple key points here is that the lowest income residents of this study area are commuting over 50 miles to work at 2x the rate of those making over 40k. So just really dramatically long commutes. And then we're also seeing this growing bifurcation in the commute uh, distances. And we've, all, we've seen this in uh, Boston, in Detroit, in many cities where we've worked. It's just sort of a trend that's happening. But um, across all income levels, that over 50 mile commute is the fastest growing segment. Um, and then what's interesting is the second fastest is the less than 10 miles. So you have this return to cities, but then you also have people just having to go further and further to access jobs. And then on the bottom, uh, bottom right-hand side, the important point is that this is disproportionately impacting your lower wage workers, um, share of growth, you know, it was about 5x um, what it is for the people making over 40K. So I have two sort of example slides here and then get to the meat of the findings. Um, so this is just showing sort of the analysis, uh, the methods. We basically have all the census tracts in that five county area. We have all the zip codes in that five county area. And in the middle there, I guess this is maybe a, this is a little bit of a zoom in, you have that little black dot there is the mean center of jobs. And then you're looking at different cuts of the workforce. So in this case, we're showing uh, race, ethnicity. And you can see the Hispanic population in blue is sort of pulled up by Lawrence and some other cities um, to the north. But that's a good bit further from the jobs right in the middle there. Likewise, the African-American population quite a bit distance further south, pulled down by Dorchester, Roxbury, Brockton. Um, but just sort of give you a sense of the methods that are gonna go into this uh, upcoming slides. Um, we also looked at how, these, uh, how this varies for different clusters. So I wanted to just highlight these sort of two extremes. Um, on the left-hand side, you're seeing a map of the neighborhood cluster, which sort of local cluster, it's sort of, it's everywhere. Um, and you can see it's not really too concentrated anywhere. It's pretty evenly distributed throughout the region. Um, the education requirements are pretty low. It's, you can get these jobs with you know, a high school diploma pretty easily. Um, the wages are lower, but then, so as a contrast, on the right-hand side, you're seeing drugs and pharmaceuticals, which is sort of one of the top uh, traded clusters in Massachusetts. And you can just see that it's highly concentrated. It's all out on Route 128, 495, and there are these little uh, hot spots where it's really concentrated. So can guess sort of less accessible for those, uh, for those zip codes. And then this is sort of the, the big takeaway here, looking at how far uh, different cuts of the workforce are to jobs, to the mean centers of jobs, and seeing that how this sort of uh, compares across different cuts. So what this is showing is that the Hispanic uh, working age population is over 5.7 times further 
from jobs than the white non-Hispanic population. For blacks, African Americans, 5X. Um, when you look at this by educational attainment levels, um, residents with less than a bachelor's degree are about five times further from jobs than those with a bachelor's degree or higher. Uh, it's even more extreme for high school dropouts, where it's about 7.2 times further. Um, maybe not too surprising, but for the unemployed, it's about 2x the distance from uh, jobs compared to the employed persons. And then we'll see, another di see some more dynamics around poverty, but it's about three times further. Um, on the bottom, sort of now shifting gears a little bit, this is now thinking about the distance of those zip codes and those jobs to the mean center of the workforce. Um, and sort of showing two examples of traded clusters just sort of off the charts with uh, they're 8.4 times further from the mean center of the workforce than you know, the entire economy is. And then likewise, drugs and pharmaceuticals, 6.5. So we also looked at this over time. Um, and uh, since the recession, so we're looking at 2010 to 2015, you see it's actually gotten worse for all racial ethnic groups other than, or compared to the white non-Hispanic population that's in red, they've gotten further from jobs. Um, it's gotten better on an education basis, and that's I think in part because you used to have PhDs working at McDonald's or any job they could get, right? Just whatever it would take to pay the bills. Um, the most disconcerting one is this, the, it's actually gotten worse for residents below poverty since 2010, when you're thinking that was pretty rough. Um, on the cluster side, there's um, some improvement for some of these traded clusters, but I think the real takeaway is just it's still really bad. <laughs> it's still a high multiplier. Um, now, I think there were some earlier panels uh, that really did some deep dives into transportation planning. But um, just wanted to show this very basic measure, but hey, can I even get to this job via public transit? Um, regardless of how many transfers or it takes three hours, um, just is it even possible? And the big takeaway is over a fifth of all jobs in this region, you just can't get there. Not possible. You need to get in a Lyft or an Uber or you know, bum a ride somehow to get to these jobs. And you can see that's the whole, all that red area over on the right-hand side. Um, the one encouraging thing is that the areas with transit access are growing faster than the areas without. So it's getting better, at least, but uh, still not great. And then you sort of might have predicted this by now, but the jobs that have lower education uh, requirements are less accessible than those with a, a bachelor's degree or higher. Um, hang on, I'm running out of time, so just gonna jump to sort of uh, some of these practice and policy implications. So sort of from that last slide, Maybe the biggest play is just needing to either shift or add some new bus routes to serve some of that area that does not, any, does not currently have any transit access. Um, likewise, there's maybe a play around sort of improving that last mile access. So if you can get to a transit stop that's out there, expand that buffer from you know, a half mile walk to, oh, hey, now I can jump on a bike and make it a five mile buffer around the job or three mile, whatever it might be. Um, it's also, I think this is maybe a little bit iffier uh, with the policy side, but if there's some way to get a tax credit or maybe just discounts for low, moderate income workers um, with extremely long commutes, because that really hurts their bottom line. If you're only making 15K and you're spending four hours and 10 bucks or more on transit every day, that really hurts. Um, sort of the elephant in the room that's sort of obvious um, is affordable housing and TOD and I'll say we looked at this quickly, and uh, the um, jobs over 500K in value were about four times closer to jobs than those below 100K. So it's sort of not too surprising. But um, then for practice purposes, um, just a couple of key, key quick points is that the region is not the same thing as the city. So if you see the region growing, like, oh, this cluster looks great, it doesn't, I mean, that's good and all, but. It doesn't mean that people in the city or that all your residents can actually access it. So sort of that push for it, you need local data and the actual location of those jobs matters. Um, all too often we see people pushing uh, to be the next IT hub or the next traded cluster X, Y, or Z, and sort of just thinking that, hey, not every city is gonna become the next hub for this, uh, for the cluster of the month or the year. 
and you're sort of missing out on an opportunity with these neighborhood and regional clusters that are accessible, provide pretty good wages for uh, lower income and less, or sorry, for less well-educated residents. Um, I'll just end with this last thing, is that economic opportunity to us is sort of, we're thinking this is about education requirements, it's about wages, but it's also about physical access, which really in the practice world, we all too often just sort of don't think about that. We just let it go and, yeah, it's in the region, great. So they'll, they'll find a way. Um, so anyway, thank you. And so thank you so much uh, for our, uh, all of our panels. We've heard about um, bike uh, paths and bike, uh, uh, bike accessibility to jobs. We've heard about um, analyzing job clusters in industrial growth areas, um, addressing um, the, winter, the, the gender wage gaps, and then also looking at the correlations between access to quality jobs, jobs clusters, and the transportation systems and policies and practices. And so um, now we want to hear from you all uh, if you had any questions for our panelists. And when you do, uh, can you just stand up and say your name and where you're from so we'll have a good idea of uh, the questions. Yes, please. All right, uh, Jake Levine, economist with the uh, Massachusetts Department of Telecommunications and Cable. So I just want to ask, uh, there seems to be two tr worries in transport with economic development. A, getting the workers to their jobs, but B, also a lot of these jobs seem to produce a lot of heavy traffic, trucks, freight, things like that. So how do you reconcile it to make it both accessible to the workers who need to be there and also accessible to the traffic, the trucks, need to get out of there. both those users, right? And so it's about what types of jobs are, or businesses are we attracting into Boston? And it's also thinking about who are going to be the users of that. And so I would think an investment in other types of infrastructure um, would be important to that. I guess I'll add for, um, for some sort of newer industrial developments, there's also literally just a design piece of this is thinking hey, let's have, make sure we have truck access in the back away from the adjacent neighborhoods or residential areas. Um, so some, some of it's just doing intelligent design, getting good uh, landscape architects and good architects and urban designers in there. Um, and I guess, uh, I mean, I don't know, in, in some cities you have this sort of interesting, uh, maybe underutilized sort of alley network. Um, and I realize in Boston, some of those are pretty tight. <laughs> so yeah. maybe, maybe it's a little too work. tight for a box <laughs> truck, but um, there is also sort of these, in warehousing and distribution, there are these shifts in urban areas to smaller trucks, like yeah, the 14-foot the, the box truck that can squeeze into existing parking lots versus a you know, 57-foot plus double tractor trailer, that way it's just impossible to maneuver. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, I think that's, it's, it's a good shift, it's, it's good that that's sort of how it's slowly moving. Um, and I think regionally, there's also just that play for these now million square foot warehouses out link, right, right next to the interstate. Um, looking around, I don't know, I'm thinking of Atlanta. There's dozens of new multi-million square foot uh, warehouses going up that are right next to the interstate and just sort of, uh, for better or for worse, they're pulling out of the city, but they are at least not causing 10,000 mm -hmm. Amazon delivery trucks to show up every hour. <laughs> Maybe drones too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. The dr yes, drones is the solution. That's it. <laughs> yes, please. Um, I have a question about your Can you analysis. Say your name oh, sorry. Uh, Tim Reardon with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Oh, and a microphone. Uh, <laughs> question about the survey. You, you indicated that some of the property owners in New Market said that they were not interested in sort of selling at this in this particular part of the real estate cycle, which I I think is. Interesting. I mean, how do you how do you sort of square that with the incredible demand for conversion of industrial space to residential uses in the city, and the sort of growing scarcity of that, and how we start to look at policies to protect 
you know, lower cost industrial space in order to preserve, you know, sort of opportunities for that type of business development. And I guess, like, what insight did you gain through that survey or conversations with business right. owners on that topic? <laughs> no, that's, that's a great question. That's like the million dollar question for Boston real estate, right? <laughs> um, so sort of what we found is that there's that interplay between zoning um, <clears throat> and expectation of future housing prices. Um, so a lot of the landowners in New Market, sort of on these vacant parcels, are sort of just sitting there waiting for the zoning to flip to residential, and then they're going to sell, make a ton of money off of uh, residential uh, condos versus a sort of a, an industrial space. So that's where the sort of the policy pieces come into play. So I'm sure you know this, but like the New Market recently rezoned some of their areas to allow strictly um, industrial uses. And now sort of the push is to rezone the rest of the area to um, sort of protect um, through zoning, um, uh, keeping these industrial areas industrial, and then that will sort of set the frame for, for maintaining industrial areas versus flipping it to uh, residential. Oh, did that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> we have um, time for just one more question before we wrap it up. Yes, please. Uh, and I'm Marce Crozes. I'm at Harvard with the Institute for Quantitative Social Science. I just have a question about the gender uh, gap data, and I, I'm familiar with what the Faraday system uh, and so, but but more about the data that, uh, itself, how it comes. So, for example, when you compare within executive uh, category, uh, could it be that the women choose choose or not choose, but somehow end up in in a smaller Mm -hmm. companies and um, it's not so much that there that there is um, a discrimination in terms of the the salary uh, but uh, but it's just that uh, we're comparing types yeah. to different type of uh, stress level jobs <laughs> so yeah so we use the um, the same uh, job categories as the what the EOC collects um, and so it's determined, it is based on what the company, right, classifies as executive or as support staff or administrative yeah, assistant. from a, a wide range of companies. Yes. So the, it's different to be an executive of a 20,000 Sure, yeah, and that's one of the reasons why in 2018, so our data right now, it's 16% of the greater Boston workforce, and it is, we have a very diverse group of businesses in terms of size. Um, we have some, you know, employers that have thousands of employees, um, and then we have some employers that have, you know, three or four people. Um, so obviously, it's going to be different, uh, different levels. Um, but it's, it's, it's what we what we hope to do in 2018 is to be able to break it down by industry and size of company eventually too. Okay. That's um, very interesting yeah. to see. Well, you know, I, mean, I think it still could be that that there is no entry. There yeah. Is, well, and, and I think the, you know, but I wonder if that's part of part of our work, you know, it's not just about the data. Like this report that we put together every year is such an important piece, but it's about. Um, having a tool for companies to assess their information. Every company we talk to about this, when we first try to recruit them, they say, we don't have a wage gap. And I say, no, you do, because everybody does. And, you know, and so this is where it's so important to understand what your data is. And so the exercise of having to put it into the system, while we don't see that breakdown for your individual organization, that allows um, human resources or your general counsel, whomever, to do the exercise and be more yeah, aware. Yeah, no, Great. Um, I, I just want to say that this is not the end. Um, these forums are really about to open up uh, more conversations about access to equity. Um, and so uh, you feel free to follow up, um, maybe even have a, a small forum within your networks about these important issues. Um, and so this is not uh, the end. In fact, it's just the beginning for you to think creatively about thinking about economic uh, opportunities and equity in your own work. Um, and so um, join me in um, thanking all of our great rock star panelists and their work. <laughs> Thank you, Trin. Thank you. Thank you.